Timothy Treadwell, a man, a lesson. Timothy Treadwell left California for Alaska for 13 summers, setting up camp among some of the biggest and most numerous brown bears still roaming the continent, until one day he couldn't anymore. The bodies of Malibu, California residents Tim Treadwell, 46, a self-described eco-warrior and photographer, and Amy Huguenard, 37, a physician's assistant, were discovered on a cold Monday morning on October 6, 2003, near Katmai Bay, according to the USGS Topo map. But what may have transpired to cause such a tragic death? Let's find out. The third of five children, Timothy Dexter Treadwell was born in New York in 1957. Tim claims that when he was a teenager, his home life fell apart and that he frequently got disgustingly drunk. He also claimed that he once damaged a family car. Tim then moved to Southern California and ended up in Long Beach just after completing high school. Soon after, he started working in eateries soon after his arrival while going to college on a swimming scholarship. Additionally, Tim began auditioning for roles in various sitcoms under the name Treadwell, taken from his mother's side of the family. But after the college party scene took over his life, Tim lost his scholarship. He continued to abuse alcohol and drugs during this time. According to his book, Among Grizzlies, and in the late 1980s, he overdosed on heroin and cocaine before being saved by Terry, a Vietnam veteran he had grown close to. Whereas, Terry then encouraged Tim to go to Alaska for seeing bears once he was released from the hospital. His first forays into camping were nearly amusing. He noted in his journal that he frequently suffered from hunger, cold, and insect annoyance, and that the first time he spotted a bear, it fled. Tim later expressed his sadness at being perceived as a threat by bears. So, when did a piece of advice so basic from Terry turn into an obsession for Tim? Well, it all dates back to California. Tim worked as a bartender and kept sober while spending the winter back in California. And while he was there, he co-wrote the 1997 book, Among Grizzlies, Living with Wild Bears in Alaska, with a former girlfriend named Jewel Palavok. Together, they founded the nonprofit organization Grizzly People with the goals of educating people, particularly kids, about bears and raising money for his journeys to Alaska. The National Park Service was concerned about Tim's actions soon initially. Records from the Park Service show that Treadwell received a penalty from park authorities in 1998 for keeping an ice chest full of food inside his tent, whereas he received a command from park officials to take down a forbidden portable generator on another occasion. From 1994 to 2003, there were a total of six park violations and complaints, including miscellaneous altercations with tourists and licensed guides, guiding tourists without a license, camping the same place for more than five days, inappropriate food storage, as well as wildlife harassment. However, this did not stop Tim from being obsessed with wildlife, especially the bears. Who knew that this perception of his would one day lead him straight into death's den? Additionally, Treadwell's refusal to carry bear spray infuriated park officers. A few years before Treadwell passed away, Deb Liggett, the superintendent of Katmai National Park, became so concerned about him that she met him for coffee in Anchorage. Liggett commended Treadwell for gaining support for the bears and for being more cautious in his warnings to others not to try what he did. But she and other park officials were still quite concerned that one swipe of the paw would undo all of that and result in a frenzy of stories about fearsome people-eating grizzlies. But as far as it goes, love is blind, and love conquers all. So was the case for Tim and Amy's love story. Evidently, Amy Huguenard did not have the same worry as others when it came to Tim's obsession with the bears. In Aurora, Colorado, Amy, a physician's assistant, first fell in love with Treadwell's book, and then the author himself. 
On January 31st, 2003, Huguenard resigned from her position and relocated to Malibu, where she planned to begin her new career when she and Tim came back for the winter. The couple had spent a portion of each of the three summers before in Alaska, but as fate had already predecided their journeys for them, Tim and Amy wanted one last chance to see the bears before winter set in. So, on September 29th, 2003, Willie Fulton brought them to Kaflia Lake once more. Unfortunately, as heartbreaking as it may sound, the couple was found dead eight days later. But what could have possibly happened, and what might have caused the first fatal bear attack in Kantmei's National Park's history? Honestly, it would be simple to theorize that Tim's passing was because he frequently approached bears to take their pictures, right? But if we're to examine the facts, they reveal that while this is partially true, it was still a contributing element. That's because, the night before Willie Fulton flew in to pick up Tim and Amy, that is when the attack and murders took place in the cam and not during the daytime when Tim would often be out filming and socializing with bears. When a bear enters a camp, particularly at night, we know that it's not a typical bear encounter, but rather one involving a bear that may have been accustomed to humans and human food, trash, or an older bear no longer able to feed on natural foods as effectively. We also know that bears occasionally entered Tim's camp at night during previous summer excursions. But then again, for Tim, this was nothing unusual. After all, he had interactions with the same bears every year and felt he knew them all well since he tented on established bear trails or close to intersecting bear trails. So then what could have happened? Well, there is a hypothesis as to what happened on that chilly, stormy night. Tim and Amy plan to extend their stay by a week to look for a favored bear they haven't yet seen. Further, bears in Katmai National Park typically start to den in October or November and enter hyperphagia in early September as they attempt to eat in large quantities to gain as much weight as possible before den building. The salmon run had come to an end as well, and the river that ran through the grizzly maze still held some of the year's final salmon. That being said, there's a chance, and some speculation, that grizzlier, unidentified bears from the interior may have crept in and driven off the bears Tim was accustomed to seeing and engaging with every year. Tim's confidence was questionable. On one hand, he looked like a man on a mission and built the trust of many, but on the other hand, it was laughed at by many. This was due to the fact that many didn't see this as confidence, but rather mere pretentiousness. Come here and camp here. Come here and try to do what I do. You will die. You will die here. You will freaking die here. I found a way. I found a way to survive with them. Am I a great person? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we're all great people. I'm just different. And I love these bears enough to do it right. And I'm edgy enough. And I'm tough enough. But mostly, I love these bears enough to survive and do it right. And I'm never giving this up. Never giving up. The older, heavier bear that killed Tim and Amy had the number 141 tattooed on the inside of its upper lip and had been ear tagged as part of a wider study experiment in 1990 following the Valdez, Alaska oil spill. Also, bear number 141 was described as a skinny but robust 1,000-pound 28-year-old male that was presumably looking to bulk up for the winter with damaged canine teeth and others are worn down to the gums at the time of necropsy, which was performed three days after Tim and Amy were murdered. There were also rumors that bear number 141 was a bear that Tim had never interacted with before, according to the pilot who brought Tim and Amy out every year, Willie Fulton who had then claimed that this was a bear he had never seen before, and that it was just a dirty, rotten bear that Tim didn't like anyhow and wanted to be friends with, but never occurred. Likewise, it is now thought that bear number 141 was a bear that Tim had named Ollie the Huge Old Grouchy Bear, after seeing the video recording he recorded 10 days before he was murdered. Considering bear number 141 had previously been trapped, tranquilized, and tattooed, Tim and Amy's friends have also conjectured that the bear was mistreated and possibly came for them that night. But is the bear really responsible for such a tragedy? 
Not really. An odd person with uncommon conduct towards bears, tented in the center of a highly perilous scenario, is to blame for this tragedy if we're pointing fingers. Which, of course, in this situation, is Tim. Not to forget that Tim and Amy died as a result of Tim's, and only Tim's, careless disregard for his safety, his overconfidence in dealing with bears in the past, luck really, as well as his error of assigning anthropomorphic values to bears and disregarding established federal guidelines when photographing and camping with brown bears. Is it going to happen that, that one day we read a, a news article about you being eaten by one of these bears? Um, no, you know, and, and So, moral of the story? Quite simple if you may ask. Grizzly bears should always be handled as wild, unpredictable animals, because they are, and never as a pet or a cute bear to cuddle with, ever. Well, that's it for today. Do share your thoughts on today's video with us in the comments below. Also, if you wish to catch more of such content, don't forget to like and subscribe. Until then, take care of yourself, and stay away from the bears.